This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. That was a fun show. Shake them ropes, Jeff Hawkins, Chris Novembrino. No sponsors this week, so we're not held down by the man. Yes! Finally, I can say how I really (laughs) feel about wrestling. You know, uh, sometimes sometimes old Novi pulls the punches, but not this week. This week, I'm coming in hot. Coming in on fire. We're both kind of on fire. We've been a little ranty in the pre-show. Gonna put Chris over a little bit uh, from our VOW Slack. One Joe Lanza listened, said, uh, Novembrino is the best kept secret we have, even though he will never see this. And Chris, I think much like Joe's intros on the flagship, that that should now be your moniker. I think I'm going to make that happen. The best kept secret on Voices of Wrestling. I'll take it. I'll take it. Okay, cool. Uh, Chris, how are you? Oh, you, you don't want to play hardball on the lead in? You know, no. you know, all right. He, all right. Hold, on, hold on. He told me to say, to set him up with Chris. When you ask Chris, how are you? I have a rant. And then I go, well, maybe I should just ignore that and try and try and deny him the chance. I was hoping we would pull teeth on this. No, I, no, no. I'm not Rob McCarron. I'm going to just give you your moment here to shine because I'm going to rant a hell of a lot today. Not angrily, necessarily. Not angrily rant, but there's there's a little rantiness in me. But please, Chris, well, it how would are have, you? It, w- it would have been better if I could have came in with an affected bother. Um, and so in that <laughs> sense, in that sense, you kind of left me hanging here. You did. Uh, but oh, that's see, okay. See, no, no, hold no, on. no, 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 no. Oh, now you're going to step on it as I'm trying no, to get I'm it. No, oh, no, no, it's fine. You're burying... My generosity. That's the problem I I'm have. I'm not trying no. to bury. I, I, okay. I was trying to speak from the heart. Um, oh, are you familiar with protest music? Yes. Uh, Bob Dylan. Ever heard of him? Look him up Bob after the Dylan. show. No, no. So, so the songs are really great. I think, I think little, you'll find some stuff Barry that you really McGuire, like. Little Eve of Destruction. You know, I can yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah, So okay. uh, here's the thing. I was watching SmackDown this week, Jeff. Yeah, you see the guitars out. You see the guitars out. And once again, someone was absent from the show. Uh, I was absent from Raw. Absent from NXT UK, absent from NXT, and uh, I have something to say. But not absent from your heart, you're saying. No, no, never absent from my heart. Never <laughs> absent from my You know, and a lot of classic folk songs, they start with the little strummy strum before they get into the actual words, but here we go. How many roads must a slab jack go down? Before we see Slapjack again, the answer, my friend, is jacking in the wind. No, no, The no, answer no. is jacking in the wind. No. That one goes out to you, Joe Lanza. No, it's the worst comedy bit we've ever done here. It is not. <laughs> I think I that's, wanna... got a, that's got a powerful message. What is wrong yeah. with jacking in the wind? <laughs> I didn't want to give this family friendly, Chris. That's what... Slap That'll Jack? answer your question. Sla- okay, Slapjack's a character on a friendly show called WWE that we're talking about. What's wrong with jacking in the wind, you what? say? Yes, it's... I think it's it's like the answer. By the way, I, the, again, uh, it's not it's not jacking in the. W- There's a question. What is missing? You know what is absent, and the answer is jacking in the wind. Uh, uh, go to Voices of Wrestling on YouTube, and you can see my reactions to all of this. Uh, I guess that's better than my bit that I was going to start the show with. But uh, let's just get the news. Big news coming out of this week is it Fightful, our friends over there, Sean Ross Sapp and company, Jeff still on the roster, though on the bench. Uh, turns out after this past Friday's SmackDown that uh, Daniel Bryan's contract is up and he is uh, he is now officially a free agent with no waiting time to go anywhere. Any thoughts on that, Chris? 
I tend to think he resigns with WWE. <laughs> ultimately, I, I, I know that maybe the hot take is he could go over to AEW and do big matches. He might be interested in doing that. He also might be like, I'm working a really, really easy schedule these days and I'm making money and I've got a kid who's eventually going to be going to college in the next decade. And it would be fairly dope to have another three or four year contract where I have a kind of light mid card schedule where I'm never asked to work more than like, you know, 10 to 15 minute matches or whatever. And not having to carry the big high risk spots, you know, not having to do the hell in the cells or anything like that. Like, the mid card range is an okay place to make your money, and it's six figures. Uh, I would like to see him go to AEW and have matches with some of the people they have over there in AEW right now. I'd like to see some of the stories that Daniel Bryan could tell in AEW. I just don't see it in the cards. And then I also wonder maybe does Bryan want to deal with the politics of AEW? I know everyone thinks that AEW is the land of opportunity. But right now, the vice presidents have a very strong hold over the broader television narrative um, with Kenny Omega um, and the Young Bucks lording over kind of the world title picture. Cody always has a large role in terms of uh, on-screen time. And is there a lot of space for a guy like Daniel Bryan if he went over to AEW to really kind of explore his art? I don't know. I agree with you with a caveat because the, I was actually – it's going to bring up the college fund uh, thing as well. Yes, that's going to be very important uh, eventually. But Daniel Bryan has a lot of money right now. And between he and Bree, they are pretty well set. Um, I think he's going to do, though, a few fun gigs for himself before he resigns. I don't, he may do a one shot in AEW. I don't think he goes there permanently. I could see him going to like Ring of Honor. For maybe a special match. I could see him going to New Japan for a little bit. I could see him I could see him going to like DDT for a short stint as well. He's gonna do stuff he finds fun that he thinks will elevate the business in the real sense, not in the for lack of a better term. There well, no, I'm not gonna bury him just yet. But uh there are some veterans who go, Hey, I'm elevating that guy by being in the ring with him. Whereas Daniel Bryan to me really cares about elevating the industry as a whole i could see him doing i could see him doing a pwg show just on a lark like as a as an unannounced competitor in some way but i do think his father-in-law works for the company his wife works for the company his wife's financial future on television is tied to the company i i think eventually he does resign like a legends contract or something with wwe though that, that's they, they give him a really good one, too, I bet. Like, mm-hmm. I, I just think the offer is super attractive. You're right. Like His heart would not be into a let's go to war against WWE sort of thing to save the industry. Like That's not where Daniel Bryan's head's at now that he's he doesn't married. Have a, he, doesn't have a, he doesn't have an axe to grind. If, if, if this to... was maybe 10 years ago before he was like, you know, married to Brie and when he was still a little younger and you know, still a little hotter headed, um, perhaps, perhaps. Um, but now, you know, he's down peace. He's a happy man. I don't begrudge him for that. Uh, I just don't see it in the cards for him to like lead the charge for AEW against WWE as as the poster boy for the grave injustices that WWE did in terms of their writing over the last decade. Yeah, this is the movie star comedian who decides he wants to get back to his roots and wants to start playing some small clubs, some mid-sized clubs, get in touch with his stand-up again. I, I, I think he values the art more than the commerce, but also more than the fame. So, yeah, I, I, I think that. And uh, pretty much a good transition to our any main roster talk we might have. Several. This is the Wrestling Observer. Several newcomers on the way. On Raw, they promoted the return of Eva Marie with the graphic Evolution. Yes. And Chris, on main event, as part of the Raw roster, Jinder Mahal and Indo Sheer are a new heel trio for Raw. God help us. A new group called the Diamond Mind set to debut on NXT, and Mansoor El Hale. I can't say his last name that well, but we, we'll call him Mansoor. It's now a regular member of the Raw roster. Oh, let's, let's get into this Raw, because 
it was one of the worst television shows. It made no sense. And it was actually anger inducing the more you watch it. Let me start off first. If you're going to watch next week, I'm going to spoil it for you because I can tell you what the, it's the go home show for WrestleMania backlash. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago, you might recall that uh, Braun Strowman pinned Drew McIntyre. Last week, Bobby Lashley pinned Braun Strowman. And this week, Drew McIntyre has a match with Bobby Lashley. Chris, use your Karnak like skills of precognition and guess, just guess what the finish to this, to the main event of Raw will be on Monday. All three of them attacking each other <laughs> as we go off the air. No, no, that's post-match. That is post-match, and that is correct as well. I will give you partial credit for that. But uh, Drew McIntyre is going to beat Bobby Lashley on this show. Uh, so that but with, everybody... With some, no, but with some controversy. With some controversy. It's not going to be clean. Yes. Yes. Well, actually, I think it might be. I think there'll be a distraction by distraction. Braun, yep. And it'll be clean. And they'll go, oh, my God, if Drew does that on Sunday, he'll be the, <laughs> the WWE champion again or universal yeah, WWE champion again. But it's 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 the it's the, the worst tropes that they have of three way things where everybody has to beat the other guy going in. So they're all 50 50. But this isn't even the worst stuff about raw that this whole undercard is is a mess do you happen to have the results in there if not i will give you time uh, uh, to of raw them up. of raw no i was like reviewing them because i was like trying to jog my memory as to what this show was and this was truly a mind eraser of a card when you go like down match by match these were these were god-awful matches this week jeff <laughs> this is a bad show hit me with them Okay, we began the show this week with AJ Styles and Omos coming out and making fun of the New Day, and then they had a match with the New Day, and they defeated the New Day. This match was the exact same thing as WrestleMania. No change it, here. It's they the were, only match uh, Omos knows how to have right now, Jeff. Uh, apparently, they were vacationing in Nigeria, which might be news to Apollo. <laughs> But I, I found that line a little problematic. Um, yeah. Uh, next. <laughs> yeah. The actually the AJ. No, real Go quickly ahead. here. The AJ promo at the beginning of the show sort of highlighted a giant plot hole here over the last several weeks. Some of which mm -hmm. was, I guess, was medical induced. But like. It's just glaring. Um, and so we're immediately drawing attention to, yeah, no, I know we've lost all sense of momentum coming out of WrestleMania here. Uh, but uh, please pay attention. You'll enjoy this. Next, we had Charlotte Flair come out. Uh, Charlotte Flair and Sonya Deville. Oh, the, the chemistry between these two. Just the, <laughs> the intrigue, Jeff. Where will this story go? Uh, I, and I actually think Sonya ends up like being the good guy in all of this and having a change of heart after being pushed by a Charlotte Flair type character. But she she's going to have to beat Adam Pierce for the GM role first and be the heel and then eventually be redeemed. But yes. Yeah. Well, the men are having a triple threat. Let's have the women have a triple threat. And here comes Rhea Ripley, who is I'm sorry, she's being misused again. <laughs> we don't know if she's face or heel. She's just being a jerk. Asuka comes down to be a jerk, and Charlotte's a jerk. So we have three jerks in the three-way. That's that's, f And we have Sonya Deville being a jerk by eschewing all the rules. And your, getting, your like, yeah, yeah, getting steamrolled by Charlotte, and yeah. Uh, this is another match with no intrigue either, because like, you don't really mm -hmm. believe that either I, I i guess maybe charlotte could beat Rhea, but like Rhea's kind of been like a heel so i i just sort of assume that Rhea's hanging on to this title here um next next miz and john morrison having the same segment that they have every week uh at this point it the, this story with damian priest the yes the angle with bad bunny at wrestlemania was dope um, but it overstayed its welcome in the build to WrestleMania, and now without Bad Bunny, the best part of that whole angle, this is just absolutely flavorless. And when The Miz and John Morrison brought up, hey, hey, hop, hop, I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. Bad Bunny isn't here. That's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up, guys. 
nothing further, Your Honor. Next. Yeah. Uh, Lucha House Party, who really, the party feels kind of empty without the trilby guy uh, in, in the crew. <laughs> you know, like that guy was really bringing it for me. Um, but they defeat Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin. <laughs> Oh, uh, this this was red hot. And then afterwards, Alexander grabs the microphone and he yells at Shelton Benjamin, who is forced to like do a very weird emotional react. And it doesn't really make sense. But like, what was Shelton supposed to do there? Uh, and, and then backstage, he followed that up later with even more weak need stuff. And it it made it seem like Benjamin's not even going to try to follow up things with Alexander, that they're just splitting ways. And that's that. I hope so, because that would be the best thing for this. Otherwise, we're going to get Cedric versus Shelton 27 times in a row, with each of them winning a few times. And At, at least some what? of those matches will be good. Yeah, I guess, but this was going to be the plan when they were going to break up when they were in the Hurt Business, so they're just going to do this anyways. I, I just... Uh, yeah, Although I, uh, what is stupid is that Shelton in this promo this week, glaring plot hole was like, I'm the one who brought him into the hurt business. I believed in him. And it was actually the opposite. Shelton was the one who was deeply skeptical of Cedric Alexander the entire mm-hmm. time and doubted she- Cedric Alexander's character. And it would have made a lot more sense for Shelton to have been like, I never trusted this kid. He was a snake. I wanted to try to take this kid and mold him and keep him from turning to the dark side. But it's pretty clear that Cedric Alexander, his core, it's just not there. And now I've got to beat some sense into him chris people don't want continuity in their television shows that's why walter white one week was a was a science teacher and like three weeks later he was a physical ed teacher right i loved breaking good next (laughs) we have uh after that angel garza shoving (laughs) a a rose up the ass of drew gulak fit i mean honestly uh some weeks i feel like i'm really pushing through some of these shows you know we watch a lot of shows every week i'm like there's nothing new under the sun in wrestling been a little down in the dump since lucha underground's been gone pentagon's not been the same brand and then something like this happens and just completely redeems the concept of what sports entertainment can be as a narrative delivery device drew gulak received a rose in his ass and it was a metaphor for the pain that he caused Angel Garza. <laughs> and then he's next week he's going to have like a Christopher Walken from Pulp Fiction thing where he gives the rose. I held this rose in my butt. <laughs> in, in my butt. Because <laughs> they're not going to say it. <laughs> uh, look, there's a lot of things about this that were bad. Number one, nobody cares about Drew Gulak and Angel Garza after they've been so devalued to put over Drew McIntyre. Number two, any other wrestling company, and even this company for the past 30 years, they do this angle and you get the stupid over com- overreaction comedically of getting the rose in the buttocks and maybe the possible thorn. But instead, they went for the viciousness and the sadism and the very Lord of the Flies aspect of sexual assault here, which to me is a little problematic in the 21st century in 2021, Chris. They, it was a little too serious for me for him to put the rose in the trunks, kick him in it to drive it further it was way too and vivid yes no yes. reaction whatsoever from drew other than the dull pain which would be the actual reaction should you be uh uh <laughs> can i put this without uh sodomized by a rose in some way you know it, it's just it was a little too on the nose, shall we say, and also is going to do nothing for either of these guys. So, because next week now, somebody else is getting something. Yeah, shoved I, in their I, butt I'm not probably. here for Angel Garza and the rose up the ass gimmick. How, how, like, how can we heighten this somehow? <laughs> <laughs> we need to heighten the disparities. Yeah. Uh, yes. It's, 
Yeah, hide the tensions. All right, next we get into the rip roar in third hour. We get Riddle and Randy Orton versus everyone's favorite tag team, Elias and the workhorse Jackson Riker. Uh, just what a what a great match this was. Set up by throwing tomatoes. And somehow Randy Orton ran into the line of fire from off screen and looked at it down and did the big, oh my God, I've been hit by tomatoes all of a sudden. Now, getting hit by tomatoes and other rotten vegetables of some kind has been a... weeks of rotten vegetable gimmicks, though. Like, are we we're doing vaudeville. This is... Yes, this is, but this is like a hundred years again. ago humor. This is actually slapstick. It is. It is. <laughs> WWE is the only place that is really trying to preserve the traditions of slapstick. The, I don't see. A, slap- well, okay, I was gonna say AEW does that. They got Chris Jericho. That guy. That guy loves this. Michael Nak is Mike. Michael Nak is out. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But yes, even the Marx Brothers are watching this and going, "That's kind of played." Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. A little Although bit over the top, guys. Yeah, come on. Tone it down a bit. Although slapstick, better than slap chat. Um Okay. All right. <laughs> Although here's here's what I will say. Uh the three stooges took some pretty serious bumps when they were making yes. those three stooges. Yes. No, like, but they- Mo Howard and the guys like broke ribs and stuff all the time doing those uh movies. Mo Mo could cut a promo. Uh they sold for the moves. The three for stooges sure. are Although I'm more of a Shemp guy than a Curly guy. But nevertheless, yeah, the, the Stooges were awesome. Randy Orton coming from God knows where to to somehow fling himself into the path of thrown tomatoes to start this feud. Uh, yeah, this is going to continue until Orton RKO's riddle for being a dope. So that's fine. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, I think this the, the tag team hangs around for a while, though. I think they have at least a title shot first. I, I think, like, this kind of does a Kenny Williams, Amir Jordan, like, oh, Riddle, you screwed this up thing, and then he RKs mm-hmm. him. Next, we get, oh, man, this is brutal. So, backstage earlier in the night, Monsoor signs with WWE. He comes in, he's in a suit. He's got a good looking haircut. He like yes. he looks he, I didn't he recognize looks, him. I didn't know who that was. Good. He looked yes. sharp. He looked yes. like uh, I, that when I messaged you it was like, "Damn, dude, he looks like a million bucks." Like like this guy ha- like yeah, five plus 5 in star power. Um international star. You you see him in the suit, you know that he means something where he's from. You don't know who he is, but he's obviously a somebody. Um he's here, he's getting treated like he's someone. And then it's downhill from there, from the theme song to the ring gear to everything that happened in this match. Um, he just came out and he looked like just another guy. Presentation was all off on this, and this match was awful. This, this was he got annihilated by Sheamus, and, and he had to get saved um, by Umberto Carrillo. And like, no, this whole thing, this is awful. This is an absolute miscarriage of how to use Monsoor, who a guy who I actually kind of like. I, I think they've, they didn't, they've, they've had a few missteps with him, but like, broadly speaking, he is a WWE success story of a guy that they found, they trained up, and he's actually a halfway decent wrestler. Yes, that's the other thing. He is, he is homegrown. He is PC trained from a talent search in Saudi Arabia, which was a problematic gimmick to begin with over there. And now you bring him in. He has the suit. He's signing the big deal. Sheamus comes in. I don't have a match tonight. Okay, I'll face you. The hot new star, dressed to the nines, looks like a guy. You put him in there. He's had a 49-0 and winning streak on 205 Live. The only thing they say about it is an impressive win streak coming into this, as opposed to hyping that. He goes in. He gets clowned by Sheamus. He loses by DQ because of Dimples Carrillo. And then, and then the final, because because the Irish smile or Dublin smile. Whatever oh the hell my they call God. It, that's, that's just humiliation. That's just breaking the kid down. After this, after this, Sheamus kills both of them. Dead. D-E-D. Dead. 
and we're going to get a three way out of this or a, or a handicap match between those two and Sheamus. And it don't matter because these oh, two Sheamus guys. Oh, Sheamus is winning that. Sheamus is winning that oh, handicap yes. match or yeah. that, that three way match. Oh, yeah, you bet. You bet. Mansoor and, and- is going to be on main event by June. Guaranteed. And you know what's funny? In the last 20 years, uh, one of the few like big beats that WWE likes to revisit uh, in their own history, we saw it tonight on SmackDown, which was the ruthless aggression moment. You know, you have the whole era. Uh, Kurt Angle's doing the challenge. John Cena comes down. He has a competitive match with Kurt Angle where he really puts Kurt Angle on his heels throughout the entirety of the match and, like, shocks Kurt Angle, and that gains him further recognition. That is the treatment that Monsoor needed. Uh, That is exactly what needed to happen in this match this week. He needed to blow Sheamus out of the water, and Sheamus needed to walk away and go, I don't want any of that. I don't need any of that. And then Monsoor's now chasing Sheamus. It didn't mm-hmm. need to be a decisive win. He didn't need to beat Sheamus this week, but he needed to shake up the universe and put the big brawling Irish guy or big brawling Irish guy on his heels. And, and this, he, it would have been great. Sheamus comes in there thinking he's going to whoop on this guy because he's small and he's like making fun. I'm like, look at you, you're nothing. And like maybe he gets a few clubber and blows on him early on. And then Monster goes crazy on him. Monster unleashes all of his level five offense on Sheamus and Sheamus goes for the hills. Simple. So simple. Very simple. And you didn't need Humberto anywhere near this. The story can be Seamus beat him up and he can come back later. But no, he has to come back the very next Monday. Ruin the debut. Both of them get laid out. And now we're we're, we're looking for another contender, Chris. That That's all I can think of is eh, not going to be our these guys. Let's move on. Oh man! Next, 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 we got Alexis Playground. I gotta be honest; I don't even watch these anymore. So you tell me what happened. Uh, this doll made her do something bad. I that doll. I have doubts. Not a fan. Not a fan. <laughs> next, we have Nia Jax, Shayna Baszler, and Reginald. These guys—they just have chemistry. Defeating Naomi and Lana to retain the women's tag team champions in two minutes, two seconds. Don't let the time fool you. This was a fantastic match. Uh, th- th- this really, really carried the show for me. It was worth Chris, it. Chris, we couldn't give <laughs> these women's tag titles to NXT because we needed them for this very important Nia Jax, Shayna Baszler, Reggie Bechdel story <laughs> and the best part about this match is in two minutes they try to put in so many different plot points like reggie had to like do something competent because we we're gonna sabotage reggie bechdel with angel garza who's shoving roses up everyone's asses um and then there's the dynamic between shana and naya that's complicated like the god this is just great stuff between this and SmackDown, and I had nothing else at, for this show because the Dana Brooke Charlotte thing didn't matter to me, so I didn't care. And then no. whatever, the, and then the main event. What, was there anything else after? Oh uh, n- uh, no, it's, it's Lashley and Strowman. Th- that match just went on. Like I, those yeah. guys, those guys stink together. Like they, they're just boring. Like they don't have good chemistry. Chekhov's third commentator at the booth, who will eventually have to get involved because can't control himself when somebody gets thrown into him accidentally you know it's just we've we've seen it uh two quick points on smackdown before we move on uh i like this jimmy uso story i I oh yeah i really like this jimmy uso story it's very layered yeah yes yes there's layers to it yeah whether they follow up on those layers and i know there are people in the company who will want to follow up on their layers shout out to you all um, but, but. You, no, I, no, dude, dude, I, like, okay, the foundation of this is uh, immediately had me hooked. Jimmy's back. Yes. Jimmy loves his brother. They picked up from the plot point in the past. What an mm-hmm. idea. Oh, who, who does that? Why would you do that? Why? Why well, would you do that? Chris, what would be the point of that? Chris, Walter Hill needs to be a science teacher who turns into a drug dealer. It is a story that draws on the past to get to the future. It's very good. Continue your point. I love breaking good. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, Jim, Jimmy comes back 
immediately we start to see the tensions of like Jimmy, he loves his brother. Jay still loves his brother, but Jay's changed as a person. Jay's now in the hole here with Roman and like the whole deal with Roman sort of made Jay like be broken bad, if you will, mm-hmm. to coin a phrase. Um, coming up with things. Um, and, and Jimmy's trying to save his brother here. And now there's this question of like, will Jimmy say Jay or will Jay turn Jimmy? Um, or, and, then, and then the insertion of Seth Rollins, I think is genius. Like, I actually think it adds, like, an extra layer on this of, will Roman sell out his family for Seth Rollins, who's his friend and his brother in the shield, but, like, also is willing to do whatever it takes, and he's ruthless in a way that Jimmy and Jay aren't. And, and like, there's all these different ways this could go, and I really like it. I like that Jimmy was originally with Jay helping Roman and then decided, I'm not going to be like you were. And then Jay's like, come on, man. <laughs> I had to go through so much. And Jimmy's just like, hey, let's just go win the tag titles and then he'll respect us. Or we'll just do it for us. Either way, he just wants to get the tag title. So he has a motivation that's very clear, which I like. I do. And he's not stupid either. He, yes, he says, he's not being he says very dope. clearly. He knows that Roman's, Roman's a snake. using he knows us. That he, yes. yes. Yeah, you can't trust Roman. I hope they don't break that. J- Jimmy... Jimmy sees everything clearly because he was, and they established why, because he was seeing it all from a distance. Jay has been in the fray, so he's not seeing things straight anymore. Jimmy's been out of the mix, and he's actually able to see the lay of the land from the top of the hill. Jim, or Jay was Sonny Corleone. Jimmy is Michael Corleone. He can see what's going on. He can see the moves that are being made. But we'll see if he goes to the dark side. The Seth inclusion during that promo, I almost forgot that they were in the shield together. I think that's part of the genius of it because this new mustache twirling, bad fashion (laughs) model Seth Rollins is such a completely annoying character. But I liked the intensity of almost, and and even further, the, the mob type of corollary, the heads of two rival gangs having a bit of a parlay of sorts, you know, Hey, your guy came into my territory and I want, I want you to take care of this. Otherwise we're going to have problems. I, I, yeah, I love the subtext of this right now. It's currently my favorite thing in WWE while we, while we get through things like Bailey and uh, Bianca, which didn't, I love both. Y'all know I love both. This story isn't, isn't happening. I liked her passive aggressive presentation, but the, this Jimmy thing was the only thing I wanted to bring up now because it was so good. I don't want to bring up Reggie and Naya. And no, Shana no, this, this is, this is legitimately good. And, and I know yes. like WWE has been pretty bad lately. Y'all. Um, like this, this, this week's SmackDown, like this episode and the Jimmy, Seth, Jay, Roman stuff, like, from beginning to the end of this show was great. It made Cesaro look like a million bucks coming at the yes. in, at the close here too. It put Jimmy and Jay in a crossroads situation. We had inflection points throughout the episode. Um, one other thought on Seth too. I thought Roman's dynamic with Seth was really interesting when you contrast it to the way he talks to Jay. He talks down to Jay. He talks he, to Seth like an equal. Yes. Seth is yes. much, much closer to an equal. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, and it, because he he thinks Seth is a real threat as opposed to his cousins. He that's that's a guy he respects because he's a threat, and that's that would also be why it'd be kind of cool to see him kind of go, hey, you can join us here at the table, type yes. of thing. Yeah, this um, is my brother. This is my no. Yeah. I, I I I like I legitimately see. I, actually, I could kind of see this going with Roman goes. This is my brother, and Jimmy and Jay have to keep being confronted with. He isn't family, Roman. You need to exact, stop forcing. Oh, yeah, yeah. You need to stop forcing so the good. issue of what family is. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. And and it, it th- this whole thing treats the audience like they're intelligent, and that's yes. why I, I like it so much. Yeah. Which makes sense. And, and, and to that point, Jeff, it's because especially at this point, given the kind of calling of the wrestling audience, the people who are still in this, we have a sense of history tradition. We're well versed in the history, Jeff. We're well versed in the history. Um, and we like to see like our characters go on journeys that call back to past adventures. 
I agree. Before we go into more oh, critical stuff, I say I, I think uh, I think a little AEW uh, will be nice. Okay, okay. Let's get into blood a little and guts. AEW well, blood and guts. I, for nine tenths of this match, I was in heaven, Chris. I was having a feeling of nostalgia and 14 year old Jeff trying to wait those six months for those clamshell VHS tapes of the first two war games that I wasn't live for. Cause they were in the Omni and they were in Miami during the great American bash tour. And it wasn't pay-per-view at the time. That was a dip. They had a different pay-per-view. The war games was a special event that they were just trying out. I, up until Chris Jericho got into that match, and this isn't against Chris Jericho, we're going to talk about the logic in the war games and why this match will not be held up as high as other matches of these kinds as as we go on in history. But this was brutal. It was bloody. It was a little bit sloppy, which I liked. It was guys throwing e- each other at each other to try and hurt people. It was everybody kind of got a little moment there. The unfortunate part was that Wardlow's big moment and in his introduction was during a commercial break. You gotta pay for no commercials on this thing because it killed this and it killed the climax of Tully hitting Bryce with the with in or throwing Bryce into the thing and taking the key. You gotta yes. pay for no commercials like the World Cup does. Tony Khan's got the money for it. You gotta pay for that. But my God, this is what this is the tone. This is this is the setting of the war games that I want. I want. It's felt like fighting. It's felt like they were trying to hurt each other. It the roof helped a lot, and it was a little lot higher than your normal roof, so that you could come off the top rope if you wanted to. NXT still feels like a spot show. There were weapons in this, but they weren't necessarily for Chekhov's table being set up in the day ta- where you'd have the big tower of dooms rather than through the- they were being used immediately and harshly. I thought proud and powerful were great. I thought Sean Spears was great. I thought FTR killed it in this. I thought Sammy, even that first little botch I love. Cause it's just like, he is so amped for this. He is just trying to throw his body at whoever and get cream. Now, I'm going to leave it for you for some opinions before we go into, and then Jericho entered. Yeah, no, uh, okay, look, look, uh, I I can't really add a whole lot more to your synopsis of the match at at the top here. I I think that it was a really exciting match. Um, The commercials and the picture, picture in picture does not work for me. Um, And I think, to your point, where picture in picture is really getting them in trouble is that they have forgotten that picture and pic? They think picture and picture means oh, you can keep on watching the match, and that it still has the same like narrative capture and focus. Except that if that was actually true, commercial advertisers would never want picture in picture. So the only reason picture in picture works is because it takes away my attention and it diverts my attention to the commercial. So like, if you're going to do that. And you think that that's a sneaky way of Trojan horsing in commercials, so be it. However, what then needs to happen within the formatting of this match is you need to book that portion of the match as though the camera's gone to black, um, that we're not even on air right now. Because for all intents and purposes, you're trying to pull a fast one on the viewer to let them still have the security blanket of, oh, I'm still watching wrestling, I'm not watching a commercial right now. But they're actually watching a commercial. Um, And therefore, they are not paying attention to when Tully Blanchard pulls a fast one on Bryce Remsburg in the little tiny picture that has been minimized and moved over to the far right of my screen. And they don't get to see Wardlow do physically impressive, monumental stuff when I get minimized to the side of the screen and instead I have a giant uh, flow from Progressive ad where she's at the beach once again and she can't enjoy her time <laughs> at the beach. This poor the woman, Jeff. Jeff tonight, this yes. poor woman it, it can't, it has been working for years for this freaking company. It's possessing her entire mind now she's she's enjoying 
nature, you know, with the face of God on this earth. And, and, and she hears rates and bundle deals and she can't even, it's a tragic commercial. And that's taking me away from what's happening in this blood and guts match. <laughs> Chris, this is why you don't vacation with your coworkers. You go with family and stuff. So you don't have to deal with these it, types what, of things. What, what work does to us in America is really a tragic thing. <laughs> uh, and that's all I can think about every time I see these commercials. Uh, and I should have to think, if I'm trying to think about that, if I'm thinking about that, how am I thinking about Bryce Rensburg, which is what I'd rather be thinking about most, most days. I don't think we're ever going to see one of these on commercial television again. I think these will now be on pay-per-views only for that reason. But yes, there there is no dead time in a war games match, or there should not be at least. You should also always true. be fighting. Also true. You should always be going now. Now to to the crux of criticism and arguments that I have had online and other things. Chris Jericho comes in, and he's doing sports entertainment. Chris Jericho in a way pumping up the crowd. I get that. My issues will not be with Chris Jericho's performance. Because I had no problem with that. I thought he was pretty damn great in this also. My problem is as soon as Jericho walks into the match, all the logic of war games goes out the window. And it shouldn't have because all the logic of war games was consistent. What do you mean by that? Flesh that out. I will flesh that out now. It turned into a little bit of NXT war games when Jericho got in and they did the five men in this ring, five men in that ring and the roar spot as they come together. I can forgive that. Uh, I didn't mind the ending of it. I'm not going to say Chris Jericho needed to go through concrete or something harder. They just needed to hide the camera a little bit better on that. My crux is not with him going into a crash pad necessarily with the exception of it's juxtaposed on the same show where Darby Allen is falling down two flights of concrete stairs and Chris Jericho's jumping into a pillow for, for, for the ending for a blood and guts match. That's a bit of a problem. But here's where the problem started to happen. The ring starts to get taken apart. The, the match starts to get more and more vicious. And there's a point in this match, Chris, where... All the members of the pinnacle are down for the count and the inner circle are just kind of toying with them on this. Chris, what is the point of the quote unquote match beyond, which is the original name of uh, after the war games, when everybody gets in, it is submit or surrender. Surrender. Yeah. Right. And the problem here, and and the inner circle got to submit earlier in the match too, which only heightens some of the problems in this. Like, why wouldn't you immediately, yeah, didn't they get a tap like during the? They had someone tap it out earlier in the match. Oh, oh, because but the but the match doesn't officially start until right, like ten minutes. Right, 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 right. That's what I'm saying. But like I know the yeah. match hasn't officially started, but like somewhere earlier in the process yes. of this, a limb had been weakened down on that yes. side that like it yes. could have been exploited again and should have been. Now, now all five guys should have been on one guy, trying to get that guy to submit. That's the logic in match when you have that kind of advantage. Unless a guy comes back and eventually, you know, Dax got up with the baseball bands up, but Wardlow's getting killed with knee shots. They, they have the match won and they don't take advantage of the rules of the match in, in, in this world that we've created. Now, part two of where this goes off the rails is also happens to be the problem with having the big dramatic Tully moment. And by the way, if you haven't seen Tully's post-match promo, it's pretty damn fantastic. But... Tully gets the key and we need to put a moratorium on finding ways outside of the cage of cage matches. I'm sorry. We need to establish again that these things are trapped in, but I will forgive that for this. But MJF is dead. Pretty much. He is crawling. He is wounded. Tully lets him out for a chance to escape the carnage and MJF quickly goes up to the top of the double cage. Chris, you now have a five on four advantage because the leader of the big heel group fled. Has the point of this match is ran. Yeah. Yes. The point of this match is submit or surrender. You can go after MJF. This kind of begs like, what is Tully's logic here too? If you really think about it, like why does Tully want this to happen to his guys? 
Now you can you can retcon this next week and go, oh, it was a plan all along. I knew if I went up to the cage, Jericho would follow me. Okay, fine. But it doesn't explain why the rest of Jericho's crew isn't saying, no, Jericho, don't. We need to win this match right now. And then you can go up that look at him. He's beat up and bloody. He's not going anywhere. I think Go this would have if, if, if MJF had actually been selling a body part, like let you know, going back to the the match before the match, or the ma- before the match beyond, shall we say? Um, if MJF had been at a point where he had been in the walls of Jericho and tapping out, and was like he had tapped out a couple of times before the actual match began, and it was obvious that a problem for Pinnacle was that MJF was in serious danger of tapping out when the match began, then all of a sudden it makes a ton of sense for Tully to want to get MJF out of the match because MJF is the weak link, and then it makes all the sense in the world. It's it's sort of like on the chessboard, the king is not the strongest piece on the board. It's just the most vulnerable one. Now, all of a sudden, Tully's like, I got to protect the king. I got to move the king off the board a little bit here. Um, but but MJF had been kept, not he wasn't weak, but he wasn't strong either. Dur- or he, was, he wasn't strong, but he wasn't weak either during the match. He wasn't vulnerable. Um, so him escaping from the environs of the ring made no sense in this submit or sur- surrender dynamic. And that was a real problem with this. It, it was like they knew how they wanted the match to end. And they didn't think about how you would actually get there in a way that's actually narratively coherent. So because they were so obsessed with this visual of Jericho being knocked from the cage. Yes. Yes. And that's that's my big. That's exactly how this happened. They had they had their ending, but their ending was the visual, not a plot point. Yes. So to speak. And so what happens now is during the commercial, Jericho escapes the cage. And he's screaming at the crowd and he's playing up the crowd like Hogan almost. I mean, he is come on, baby. He's smiling and everything. And this is the moment where they come back from commercial and I'm laying the blame here on not planning out commentary. Good enough. Commentary can go one of two ways here, I think, and help save this. They can say Chris Jericho is so driven by hatred of MJF. He's forgetting about the match and he needs to go back. Or if you're a heel commentator, you can say, look at Jericho. He's running out on his guys to go for personal glory right now. Either way works. Either way explains this to everybody else at at home. This is why Jericho is the 50 year old crafty veteran, former heel puppet master, Chris Jericho, all of a sudden comes down with a case of stupid baby face syndrome. To climb, a, to climb a rig to go up there. Now, he gets up to this rig. MJF. I mean, all Jericho had to say is, I'm finishing this now. He, like the yes. whole reason, The whole reason he's willing to take this risk, and he knows it's a risk, and therefore avoids stupid baby face syndrome, is he goes, I know this is risk. He doesn't have to say it like this, but it just makes it very clear. I'm finishing this. Like He kind of like looks at them. I got this. This is on me. I started this. I'm cleaning up my mess. I am finishing this now. If the, if the story is that Jericho is the victim of his own hubris, we have to have a little bit more hubris and a little bit more from commentary explaining that this is what is going on. We don't and that's kind of the problem, like right? They WWE couldn't thing. decide between Guevara and, or Jericho, who right. is the pivot point of narrative here. When like, right. This really was Jericho's story, but they wanted to make it a Guevara thing in the end. Yes, and that's the other issue here. Two weeks ago, we had the parlay where they're facing each other and they're all saying, I'm willing to die for this man. I'm willing to die for this man. You're going to have to kill me to get me to surrender, submit or surrender. Now they threaten to actually kill somebody. And by the way, aside here, because I don't think we're going to talk much more AEW after this, Miro's promo, that last line was the most fantastic promo they've had on AEW. Somebody willing to die and I'm the one willing to kill him. That yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that no. That was great. But Miro's back, back to, baby. Back, Miro's yes, back. Yeah, Miro's yeah. back. But back to the match. Sorry about the side. It was just in my head that I had to No, no, out. no. I'm with you on that. We, okay, Jericho and MJF, the the oh, the hero and the boss boss level villain up on top fighting it out while while the while the drones are down here still having a match and still beating each other up. They now have to stop. Because MJF is yelling at, but they've all been gawking this entire time. They basically stopped 
fighting. Oh, let's watch the two guys up top. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. They're like all... St- the, the, everything at the end of this match. It's... I know people were talking about Pillowgate. Pillowgate is really the least of the problems to me. So this, yes. this to me is... This Same. is blocking gate. This is blocking yes. gate. The, the issue is like every single beat of this sucked and was done poorly. Like it, it was dumb that... The inner circle actually trusted MJF when the whole point is that you can't ever trust MJF. So, like, why would they trust MJF not to push Jericho off? (laughs) I mean, like, why? Like, the whole point. And then we get into, is Sammy competent or is Sammy an idiot? Because remember, Sammy was the one who blew the lid off of MJF by everyone having cell phones and everybody recording everybody. And Sammy was the one who had the super secret, triple super secret recording that blew the lid off the whole thing this is like Zapruder film meets deep throat uh, it was it was great stuff so is he that guy or is he like emotional boob who is willing to be played by MJF and when yes. MJF pushes off Chris Jericho it makes him look like the weak link when in the whole setup to this he was the strong link which is the problem with like making the end part of this about Sammy it doesn't make sense with what the beginning part was when it came to Sammy They threw out wrestling to go into the WWE, we make movies. Here's the climax, and here's here's his friend saving his life, thinking he's saving his life, and he's not. And everybody in that match could have told you MJF's not good to be trusted here. It's the whole predicate of the match. Yes. And now Sammy (laughs) looks stupid. Sammy lost the match for them. By being Sammy, who never trusted MJF, the whole yes. point at this through for months, for months, months, he never trusted MJF. He got kicked out of the inner Go. circle for yes. not trusting MJF, and at the end of this, at long last, he trusts MJF. Hey, Charlie Brown meet Lucy in the football. You don't. <laughs> yes. Oh, no, that's such a great point, and I had forgotten about that. He was the crux of this whole thing by not trusting MJF. And the, oh, no, you won't drop. He was our friend. Oh, the guy that he built an entire inner circle behind your back in case you found out about his weaselness. And now, now, <laughs> oh, he, he wouldn't dare do something so vile as that. Not MJF. <laughs> he really cares about Jericho. <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a there's a there's a little bit of humanity in in this guy who uses people and throws them away. No, oh. <laughs> no, now he's gonna come to his senses and and do. That. Yes, that's the exact problem. With whereas, I don't care if the finish is anticlimactic in the ring in the two rings. The war games, half of these things were just a guy driving something into somebody's head, and the guy no one remembers the finishes to any of these war games really. Like, like a handful I of them do, are memorable. But- <laughs> no, but like, okay, yes. like a handful of them are memorable, but many of them, the like, ending isn't the memorable part. It's just like all of the actual yes. stuff that happens in, during the match. In each of these, with the exception of the Pillman call where El Gigante comes and covers him, the weak link is always the weak link in the match. Larry Zabisco gave up in the greatest war games that there ever was, 1992. You know, it, it, in the first one, J.J. Uh, Dillon literally gets his shoulder separated as he takes a doomsday device in the cage. You knew he was the weak link of the group because Paul Ellering is this jacked bodybuilder guy. J.J. Dillon's this doughy <laughs> manager that you're sticking in a war games. And you're, everybody's like, what? Why would they do that? And they try to put him over with this ridiculous squash match, which is great. But everybody knew that J.J. Dillon was taking the fall in this war games because he's the weak link. On the second War Games, it was Bubba in a mask, his war machine. Everybody knew he was taking the fall because JJ couldn't go. It, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be hard. Just take out the weak link of the crew. Chris- Introducing Guinness Nitro Cold Brew Coffee Beer. Blending the smooth, creamy nitro taste of Guinness with hints of coffee, chocolate, and caramel. Guinness Nitro Cold Brew Coffee Beer, your new favorite part of the day. Look for it where Guinness is sold. Must be 21 and over to purchase. Please enjoy responsibly. Diageo Beer Company, New York, New York. Jericho, at 50 years old, it's a fine story to tell, maybe, that he's 
not as spry. I mean, and the young pride cometh to. before the fall. Like, here's the thing: yes. him saying it's not stupid for him to go. I need to finish off MJF. I need to do this myself, guys. I'm going to do this. But it's also, it's not stupid. But it's also like foolish. It's overestimating your own abilities or whatever. But it's a justifiable reason why Jericho would put himself into a predicament, bite off more than he can chew, and and, and Obi Wan Kenobi gets struck down by Darth Vader finally. Um, like it, it, these, like that makes sense. Um, now to get to the actual like pillow gate part of this, uh, my only pro- I have no problem so much with the crash pad. Um, Jericho's fifty; he doesn't need to be falling off a cage through a table, Mick Foley style, or anything <laughs> like that at fifty. Um, and, and frankly, I, I don't, I don't even have a problem with more wrestlers using crash pads or even in their 30s and 40s for some of these risky bumps. I, I mean, sometimes we kill... Sometimes these guys are killing themselves on TV and it, it makes no sense to me. It's like, why? Yes. Um, it, so, like, I'm fine with that. Now, my issue with the crash pad is, one, they did a very bad job mocking it up. They did a very bad job covering it up <laughs> to make it look like it was something other than, like, the, the sploosh pad. A crash pad. pad that's in the middle of... <laughs> Yeah. That's what it looked like. No, it was like, I, I remember I used X. to dive into Put that thing X in Adventure in Time. Yeah, yeah, no. Yes. Yeah. yeah, Adventure Zone. Yeah, no, that place is great. Uh, yeah, lots of ball pit, the crash pad. Yeah, no. Discovery Zone good. where I yeah. used to work. Yeah, same yeah. thing. Yeah. Go down the little just, rolly tube slide. That thing went a little fast, huh, to be honest. Yeah, be careful I on that guy. I love working at Discovery Zone. I don't care what anybody says, but yeah. yes, continue. No, no, I, hey, like, just those. What a fun place to be a kid. Uh, no, for legit. Um, gross if you actually like think on it later, but like fun. Dude, fun I'll stuff. tell you stories about cleaning that place. But yes. oh yeah, I, I believe it. I believe it. Um, so yeah, like I I have no problem with that. But they did a really like the the metal grating was obviously cardboard with like styrofoam. Printed... Yeah, yeah. I know it looked like shit. It looked really bad. It was like those, it was like those styrofoam ceiling tiles that you put to cover yes. up like dry. Like uh, popcorn ceilings and stuff, but it looks fancy because it looks like it's actual tile. And no, it lo- it, it looked like grating, but it yeah, the yeah. camera angle was the problem here. Yes, all, the that, was, that, that was the last thing I was going to get to. Is you, you got to just shoot it from a different angle, um, and you just you know, okay, yeah, he's landing on a crash pad. How do we make that crash pad look as badass as? How do we make it look as convincing as possible? Maybe you don't show him actually landing. Duh, duh. Maybe have like the landing happen behind a wall or something. But like part of it is that like he clearly landed softly. Like when he landed, there was a squish to it. So like I, the one thing I don't need to see is him actually hitting his back against the floor, so to speak. Here's the other. Here's the issue. The crash pad is on the on the same side as uh, where the WWE hard cam would be. There are no fans on that side. So you could do it so that the crash pad is beneath the stage, so to speak. And the fans on the other side can't see it from where they are. Just have them drop a little bit further. The pad's there if physics will allow it to be safe. And then all the fans at home will see is a guy dropping through the floor. That's all they see. It could be like a gymnastics mat that's on top of a crash pad. Yes. So, so the gymnastics mat seems a little firmer, but you're still ultimately getting all the physical absorption of the crash pad. But, but the point of the visual uh, mirage that they were trying to do, which wasn't really a visual mirage, <laughs> was, mostly for the, was mostly for the fans in the audience rather than the fans at home, I think. Because they wanted to show that he was really crashing through that floor, and so the fans wouldn't turn on it. And instead, what they should have just done is a visual illusion where he crashes through some cardboard and then hits the pad, but he is down beneath anywhere where anybody in Daly's place could see. And you could rig that up, I think. You don't have to you don't have to go through this thing because they shot full on the full shot of him dropping from the cage into the crash pad and everybody there was no illusion there no for, for anybody at home no uh they, they that impact it's TV. Could, make the illusion that impact could not have looked worse um yes. it, 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 it just it looked so soft it looked pleasant like oh i could have taken that bump i i was actually yes. thinking that and and, and i 
like have a partially separated shoulder and a bad knee. I should not be thinking such things as I'm watching wrestling. I don't want anybody to be hurt, so I'm not one of these. Oh, he need to have a more brutal fall or whatever. No, do the same fall. No, Just he's shifty. From I all can, of us. No, it has to look good. It doesn't have to be real. Exactly. You know, yeah, like there's a difference here. I don't. Yeah. You know. it, it doesn't have to be real, and it can still look good. Actually, no, no, strike that. Gotta, I, I'm embracing the Bill Watts vision. I want to remove all the mats from the floor. And nobody comes off of the top rope <laughs> or no. the top of a cage. Oh, they lost the war games on a DQ. <laughs> on ding, a ding, DQ, ding, ding. no. MJF should have been disqualified from war games for knocking Chris Jericho off the top of the cage. And therefore, Inner Circle should have won. I, I had... <laughs> but, but Jericho would have had to land on hard concrete. And those of you who are listening, I put us over if you liked that, because that is the only real analysis of the story of the War Games match I have heard so far. I've heard Everyone about the match and how Everyone else has talked about worked. the work. Everyone else has talked about the work. I, I, no, I'm with you. And I actually decided to listen to a little bit of the commentary this week. No one is talking about the actual narrative. Um, yes. There are issues. I'm not into self-promotion, but I'm proud of that segment. That'll go in our... Shake them ropes all of fame that we'll never have. Uh, now to a different different beast whatsoever as a palate cleanser. NXT UK. Let's talk stupid baby face syndrome. Because uh, I've I forgot his name already. The guy who lost the loser leaves oh, NXT God, UK. No, no, you did not. No, you didn't. This is this has been these guys are like my friends. I love these Dead two guys me. almost as much Dead as I love you. Me. Almost as much as I love you. Amir Jordan and Kenny Amir Williams. Amir Jordan, thank you. Thank Amir you. Amir Jordan. This thing goes 30 minutes almost. I, oh my god. It, it went 30 minutes and it sucked the whole way down. Yes, there was god, no drama to it. Nothing. There was no drama. Amir Jordan has brutal. no second gear. He has the, there is no <laughs> second level of intensity in this guy at all. What you happy dance guy? That's what he is the whole way down when his there career's was, was, on the line. There was no increase in the stakes at all where guys were desperate for their jobs in any way. I wanted them to have the suitcase out there when he lost this match because I, I was like hoping Sid Scott would go, good, get out. Because if it can't be a double DQ, this thing, the this story, Chris, it's a street fight. I get this. Anything goes. I get this. This dude climbs up to the top turnbuckle where there's no turnbuckle pack that has been Toru Yano'd off to do a match, and he loses because the heel makes him slip, and he hits his balls on the metal. <laughs> Hoisted on his own petard and loses with no controversy whatsoever. That's my favorite thing. It's like, oh, he thought he was going to outsmart <laughs> Kenny Williams, but then Kenny Williams outsmarted him. And I'm like, why would I ever care about Amir Jordan in any promotion <laughs> ever again? Like, oh, there he is. Dancy McLoser. Can't wait to watch this guy. <laughs> I... I hope he comes back under a mask, though. That's no, I, 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 and then at the end, him trying to cry. I Now, God, granted. Yeah, oh, uh, oh but God, his, here's the drama. His, uh, Just staring uh, in the vast uh, waste. Uh, I have no... I, yeah, no, it's all everything. Everything about that performance was, I am dead inside, and I can't conjure up actual emotion to feel like, here's an idea. Tell him he lost his job. Right after the match. Uh, like, <laughs> I am, I, like, a fighting for your career match, especially for the the whole point to, now, obviously, we're talking about Kenny Williams and Amir Jordan here, which uh, on one level is the most High under- stakes in yes, the WWE NXT One of the most NXT underappreciated, universe. one of the most underappreciated angles of the last decade. But also, <laughs> some might say a low-level nothing, like, angle. So oh, idiots. you say, hold on, you I, say underappreciated, I say adequately appreciate it for what it was and that I, is, I know. Oh, look at look at look, the pin look, on your I, face I, right I, now i i am i'm trying to represent the diaspora of opinions here there are some who say it's a transcendent angle that really pulled together the last decade there are who? many 
<laughs> Who said this? I want their name and I want them fired from wrestling. Different content. people. Different people. They're, 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 they're out there. They're, they're saying you, it all the time. You are the, you are the Yamichi Alcindor of this <laughs> show. There yeah. are some who say. That some, you- <laughs> some people are saying it's a transcendent angle. Um, other people say that it's a, you know, nothing angle. Um, but if you're going to try to get Kenny Jordan over as a heel coming out of this, what would be really important in the closing stretch of this match is Amir Jordan is getting emotional and he really wants us each near fall. We, we go from he's kicking out at one because he doesn't want to lose. And he knows that this like, like you got to kick out early. You can't even take that extra second because this is your dr- job on the line. But, but as the match progresses on one turns to two. But it's like straight two. It's not 2.9. It's two. And he's still getting his shoulder up. Shoulder's hurting a little bit. He's favoring up that same shoulder that's been bothering him for a half decade. It's even worse than mine. Um, he's starting to favor it a little bit. Later on in the match, we're getting a 2.9. And every every so every time we're getting to these 2.9s, commentary's put this over. Like these two men are fighting for their lives. That that point one second is the difference between life and death. And Amir Jordan needs to be selling that. Um yes. everyone. And, 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 and it and it keeps kind of building this fever pitch, and Amir goes, "I gotta win this thing." Um, and, yes. and then does something to try to win this match. Um, Treat but- this like it's real. Treat this like it really is your job, and you're gonna have to go back to doing whatever you were doing before you were a professional wrestler. You know, you're gonna have to get a job at you know. Do the, I gotta go work in fast food again because I'll never be able to work at NXT UK. Yeah, two year Treat sentence to Dairy Queen. Great. Scrape and claw, and you should be desperate and angry. not the oh, you know, the level four NXT O face that they teach or whatever the hell it is. You know, you have to. I mean, you said it best. I think last week or two weeks ago. Earnestness. I want more earnestness in the playing of these things, and there's not. And sports entertainment does not lend itself to earnestness, but sports entertainment would be better with it. Sports entertainment would be more entertaining if the narratives are earnest. Like if you want to, yes. enter, you can, yeah, entertain me with your earnestness. And that, that's it. You entertain me with a good narrative um, and, and make that narrative earnest. Now I'll tell you what ended up being like, okay, this is like a, obviously a misstep, but ended up being like a cool little beat was this non-match between Ilya Dragunov and Dave Mastiff. I, I actually to ask thought about that this, this kind of worked well. This worked great. I yeah. thought, yeah, and I wanted, I wanted to know if it was camera tricks, if it was shoot, or if maybe Dave just said, "Screw it, elbow me in the nose and break my nose." I wonder. I, I don't no, know if this dude, was an like accident this, or not. The, if, if this was used as a plot point, it was genius. If this is a happy, it was accident. fantastic. It, no, it, it was. If, 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 it's yeah. so. It's novel. It's fresh. It made sense. Like it was. It it like worked so perfectly with Ilya Dragunov's headspace that like I I I obviously you never want to like, root for someone it, to get if, hurt if but like man this is cool if it was an accident and if it if, actually if it had happened in front of a live crowd of some kind this is the Becky Lynch moment for Ilya Dragunov during that during that invade, you know, the stupid t-shirt wars invasion that they had when Becky Lynch came in and got her nose busted up by Nia Jax. And you saw the blood running down her face and was made into a shirt and stuff like that. This time, the person breaking the nose gets over though. And Ilya Dragunov would be huge right now in terms of the NXT UK universe. I, I loved this. Quite yeah. A bit. No, this um, is cool, man. This is really and I'm cool. Fascinated by it. I'm fascinated by this. Uh, my only other note, again, you disagree strongly with me, but Noam Dar and Bailey have very similar hairstyles now. I don't disagree with you on that. I, I, I made the point that they did a convergence thing over the last seven years, and what I want to <laughs> see is like a photo documentary thing of Noam Dar going from short hair to what we can call Bailey he, Dar he hair. He a- yeah, he has it parted on the other side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but it's very, but it's like no, it's no, like, they've converged. I think they, I think they've they converged. Yeah, it's they've beautiful. converged. And, and now, <laughs> um, and then Saxon Huxley. I, you know, you've got me on to Saxon Huxley. Uh, I, I've Have seen. I? Yeah, I've enjoyed this I've, match. I've turned on him, and it's weird because watching this match, I was like, at first, I didn't like. Like, I go, what is he doing? What is his character choice here? But now it's it's almost like, you know how we 
and this was also true of the blood and guts match, how we like to make things make sense in our head by writing angles in our head, kind of, to yeah. make the things that we're watching on television. To me, it's almost like I wrote in my head, Saxon Huxley has gone from being a guy who brought books to the ring to now being full on mindless beast in the mode of, of Nord the Barbarian slash, because he's, you know, he's doing the Bruiser Brody gimmick. But at first it was the intelligent monster, and now he's just devolved into actual monster with the hussing that he's kind of doing during this match and, and things like that. I I, uh, I was fascinated by this, but I wasn't sure how I felt about this. So now I want to hear why you're sold on it. I just, the Cactus Jack elbow. Uh, and when he said, okay. there goes ha- Saxon Huxley, don't mess with him. Um, okay. A thing I think he's done the best that's worked the best for him is that poem. That, that, that poem of his about Saxon Huxley and how everyone around the town is scared of him and how that like serves as like this like totem mantra thing that the Saxon Huxley character tells himself that he wants to make everyone scared of him, that he wants to essentially actualize this poem. That, that at the end, this is what everyone will say. There goes Saxon Huxley. Don't mess with him. Um... I like that. I think it gives him some really interesting swagger. It gives him some really interesting delusion. It gives him some really interesting confidence. Um, and I think he's gotten bigger. He's not. He's not as slight yes. as he was. He just looks. He's better too. He's yeah. He's much, better. Much better than no, he was. he's better. Yes. No, he's like just a better wrestler than he was a few years ago. Um, and yeah, you know, I stopped. I, make, I stopped making fun of him on this broadcast. No, I used no, to have a name for no, him, and, and I'm not going to do that no, anymore. He's no, legit. no, no, no. He's legit. I, 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 I watch me a Saxon Huxley match now. Yeah, I, I mess with yeah. a Saxon Huxley match. Yeah. Quick, quick aside, because it was something that uh, that I hadn't noticed, but now, now that I mean. There was no Alistair Black promo tonight. Is oh, they, they didn't have the dumb? money for the uh, the uh, the drawings and stuff. <laughs> Animation wasn't done yet. <laughs> Bring him in for another. Uh, my daddy didn't love me promo. Um, it's, it's a big I one. I can see in them. WWE. I can see them. I can see, I can see them growing cold on it though. Oh, I'm just just aborting the push altogether and uh, trying something else. Or, or t- <laughs> trying nothing else. <laughs> have a, have him dance, damn it! <laughs> make, make him the. Uh, it, it's it's gonna be like the Tyrus, the last Tyrus push, the Brodus Clay push, where he's pushed as this monster killer, or whatever. And then all of a sudden, Funk is on a roll. <laughs> he just comes down. The Funkasaurus was the most over that guy ever was, though. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. what they're gonna do. It. Oh, we can't. We can't have super serious Alistair Black. Uh, we'll make Alistair Black more fun. <laughs> it's really funny. It, yeah. Yeah. No. I. 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 I could see them wanting to do that with Alistair Black, although, like, to I me... I could, too. No, you know, the best thing that could happen in this universe would be for Alistair Black to go back down to NXT and feud with Karrion Cross. I agree. Yeah. That's a nice That's a nice little uh, transition over into NXT stateside. Let's do it. A, a show s- sandwiched by goodness, but with some, some just god-awful stuff in between. Um... I think, or maybe it was just bad. I can't remember. Uh, I enjoyed, I enjoyed this match between Swerve and Leon Ruff. I was engaged in it. I was having a lot of fun with this thing. That end again, number one, stupid baby face syndrome as Leon Ruff jumps off from a high place onto a guy not involved in the match just so we could introduce this. Hey, that's what AJ Whatever oh, his name is. AJ Francis. AJ Francis, who we haven't been introduced to really, who hasn't had a match on screen, who yeah, nobody I, I, knows who this is, and they're putting it over like we should know who this that's is. That's AJ opposed to, Francis. Like, like what? Was he, was he yes, in Backstreet that's Boys? That's who that is. Yeah, do yes, I, you know, I remember him. Yeah. Oh, uh, wait, of the Connecticut Francis's? Yeah. That AJ Francis? How the hell am I supposed to know who AJ Francis is? And let's, I mean, there are two ways you could have done this. You could have done this. Who is this mystery guy who's helping swerve? Oh my God. And you could do it that way as an intro, or you could do, that's the guy that we saw in the background of 
Swerve's promos or whatever working I think at the recording they, they studio. They did do that, but like afterwards, I think, no, afterwards, afterwards they did that. I think. I, yeah, I, I think another thing that would have been good at some point is I feel like Swerve's entourage should have been named or identified at some point along the way yes. here. Yeah, I, I think that it makes sense for Swerve to have an entourage. I don't, I don't have a problem with Swerve's entourage. Actually, I, I think. Uh, the the woman they have attached with uh, them is actually going to probably be the breakout star of the whole group. Um, yeah, she, Brandy. If, um, I'm trying to remember. Her if she can go in the ring, she's going to be the breakout of, of that group. Um, but uh, yeah, I I don't hate the idea. Um, I just think that they did a bad job, sort of seeding the ground for us to go. Oh, there's Swerve's entourage. It, it you know. Kind of made sense. Swerve kept Swerve kept doing all those promos from the studio. You just never got the you never got the sense that the studio people were going to be part of the thing. Yeah, Brianna Brandy, who I think is going to be really good. Although she's yeah she's been at the PC for a few years. She's good. And then Ashanti the Adonis, the former Tahuti Miles. Oh, he's <laughs> AJ Francis. Ra- no, no, no. AJ Francis is uh, is the big guy. Okay. Okay. There's a fourth guy in there, and that's Ashanti the Adonis. Okay, okay. And he's he's going to be the red shirt. I guarantee yeah. he's going to be the red because he's a red shirt. He was a red shirt on Two Hundred Five Live. He's going to be a red shirt here. Um, he would have yeah, to be we'll right. Yeah, see what it is. They uh yeah they okay WWE recently filed the trademark the top dollar nickname which Francis uses. Uh, he was an NFL player from 2013 to 2018. You know, I like I, I like stable, so I'm happy to see where this goes. But I don't trust stables because they never build the other stable members. They always go with the, the guy they think is the star. The problem with WWE is a, stables too is that they only do heel stables. Unless AEW does yeah. do babyface stables pretty well um, on balance. Like, like it's you know it's not perfect. We have issues with this angle or that angle, but like AEW knows how to create a babyface stable and keep it babyface and do things with that babyface stable and not feel this constant urge to turn one babyface against another babyface inside of that stable. Whereas NXT right now is a whole bunch of heel stables, no babyface stable, and there's no like it, it. It would actually work great if you still had um the undisputed era as a babyface stable, and then you could feud with the Swerve people, and you could feud with, you know, uh, a, a number of the d- different, the way, uh, a number of these different groups, but um, they need a babyface stable right now. Let's go through this, including probes. Okay, so Swerve and Rough, we did that. Next, we get Cameron Grimes versus Asher Hale um, in a match that I thought was a little too competitive, personally. I thought Cameron Grimes I needed, agree. I just need to annihilate this guy. Um, yeah. ever rise backstage rules. I just like, I love these guys. I want more of these guys. I would watch if they if had you, 10 never, minutes every week on the show, I'd be happy. Mm-hmm. Have you watched their morning show on Saturdays? No, I'm on, not the, on, uh, the, I'll oh, dude, video. it is. It is fantastic. It is so fan, but they've been around. Somebody posted a friend of mine posted the results from an April, 2016 NXT show. Aliyah's on it. Everrise were in there as preliminary talent against FTR. Um, someone else who's still on this NXT roster was in there too. Not a star, but someone who's PC trained. But like Carmella faced Aaliyah. You know, it, it's weird that there's this group that's kind of just stuck there. Perma, for a perma long, stuck. Long time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, Everrise does rule. I want them on the main roster. I want them cutting pro. I want Malcolm <laughs> Bivens stuck with them. I want them oh, interacting oh, with man. Sammy Malcolm and Biv- Kevin Owens. Malcolm Bivens and Everrise, whether they were heels or baby faces, would be fun in any dynamic. Um, like yes. those those guys are they are they are comedy baby faces. They're actually good mid level heels as kind of ruthless calculating yes. jerks too. Um, like, like they they. Lots of, lots of mid-level range with these guys, uh, and I would love to see more with them. But uh, b- particularly things that showcase their personality, because um, I think Matt Martell and uh, Chase Parker, uh, yeah, they just have so much chemistry together. They're, They're great. Fun. They are yeah. so great, and yeah, they they are uh, 
They are great in all the social media stuff that they do for NXT, but of course, that doesn't make the television. So they just refer to it in a promo, which that drives me nuts. It's like, it's like if AEW did, did you watch this week's Being the Elite? Only on YouTube, and then just cut away from it. But yeah, next. Uh, Thatcher and Champa defeat the Grizzled Young Veterans. I kind of love this just a little bit. Okay, all I, right. I, I didn't have as much of a problem as some people with the ending. Because the ending should be that, uh, that the Grizzled Young Veterans get the shoe and hit one of the baby faces, and this feud must continue. I kind of liked that it was Wade Barrett's shoe got dislodged from his foot because he's trying to help his countrymen, even though Tim Thatcher from Great Britain, technically. And that, and that, uh, and that, uh, 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 Champa and Thatcher were not stupid baby faces. They saw this shoe. No, they were actual veterans. They, uh, they were actual grizzled old veterans who took advantage of situations, distracted a ref, hit the guy with the shoe and pinned him. I'm fine with this feud continuing. And I'm fine with this match. I, I, I think this, this finish works because Ciampa and Thatcher both have such strong brands built up as heel, as heel wrestlers. Yes. And, yes. And, and, you, know, and so, yes, you nailed it. Yeah, they, they are baby faces now, but we know them both to be cagey and ruthless veterans um, who are exactly the type of people capable of this. And that so, should be their name. Grizzled, ruthless oh, veterans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a fun one. I'm into that. Yeah. So... Next, we have uh, the challengers and the champ and the sneak attack. And Karen Cross comes to the ring, and then he's challenging Austin Theory because Austin Theory made some sort of comment about Scarlet's nails um, earlier in the show. That oh, was yeah, really we had, we had, yeah, we had the, the, that promo where it's yeah. like, you have those you things have big are boobs, huge. But, but they're not boobs, it's actually her nails. Um, that was ah, the whole point. yeah, I know comedy, comedy, I, I what like. It, they call it comedy, but like this is especially when you're doing it in William Regal's office. This is sexual harassment, and uh, William Regal actually should be getting up on this. Like, <laughs> that would have been the best. That would have been the best. Uh, yes, give uh, me human Austin, resources. Austin, you you gotta go for six stay months. Here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Stay, stay <laughs> here, Austin. I need to call human resources yeah. real quick. So let's go over, Austin. Let's go over why that was not okay. <laughs> 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 Look, I know on the main roster they permit these things like putting flowers on up someone's bum, but we do not. <laughs> we take things seriously here. Now, yes, we had cool Kyle. We had we had and, and boy, and cool Kyle, like a, cool. We had hope and pray dressed like a Las Vegas magician lounge act at two a.m. We had cool Kyle dressed as he's going for brunch on Sunset Boulevard at one in the afternoon on Sunday. We had uh, <laughs> we had whatever the heck uh, 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 the, the prince is doing now, Devitt. Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure what what you call the Balor character these days. Balor, it's like Balor, Balor without any of the intrigue. He's just angry now, kind of snarky, kind of arrogant, kind of. Johnny Gargano has to insert himself as as a guy with legitimacy when he's in the middle of a giant comedy angle. I know, and they're, and they're trying to like. I mean, the problem too with Gargano's insertion is he's not legitimate, and then the way that they went after Karrion Cross made it seem even more likely that Austin Theory has no chance in hell in this match against Karrion Cross. Like, I almost think the intrigue here would be for Austin Theory somehow to get like a countout victory over Karrion Cross that like Johnny Gargano can't understand and Austin yes. Theory can't really understand and it kind of pisses off Karrion Cross too and it becomes this thing that gnaws at Karrion Cross like how did Austin Theory get a count out victory over me how did that happen oh my god yeah, he, yeah. oh my god he beat the champ blah, blah, blah. yeah, you know, yeah, yeah right, right no no like, and have that like fester as a cloud over NXT for like a month that would be the most intriguing thing that could happen next week but I think they're gonna go by the numbers and Karrion Cross is just gonna and annihilate Austin Theory. Mm, whatever. And then the most intriguing guy in this match is a guy with nothing to do because they've put a, the kibosh on the entire Pat McAfee stable, and that's Pete Dunn. Pete Dunn, another guy kind of just adrift looking for a personality right now. Uh, he, he'd yeah. be better off going over at NXT UK. And that's that's the other problem right now is, is his personality works, but not in these kinds of angles. 
you know, he needs, he can't be lackadaisical when you're going for the title, it's like, uh, you know, doing the shoulder shrug, all that other stuff. He, you know, yes, you're the best. Yeah. The I lackadaisical would, thing the- got him through in the tournaments, right? Yes. Because in a tournament, it's like you're reacting to a stressful situation and there's all this pressure and you're kind of like pressure. What name so? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm yeah, a killer. Yeah. Oh, well. But, you know, it's one of those things where... But when you're going after a title in, like, the regular like regular season of professional wrestling, it's a constant chase thing. So nonchalance doesn't really matter or doesn't really make sense until you're actually the champion. I'm the best technical wrestler in NXT is not... That's, that's not a... That's something for those of us who know wrestling. It's not for people who don't know wrestling. And it's it's that kind of thing that undermines Karrion Cross as the champ, too. It, 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 you can say I'm the best technician and I'm going to find a way to break your arm off and beat you. But basically what Pete Dunn is saying, coming out there and saying, I'm a better wrestler than you and you don't deserve this title. And not in the storyline way, in the kayfabe way, or not, I mean, not in the kayfabe way, in the real way, where it's like, everybody knows I'm more talented than you type of thing, as opposed to everybody knows I'm better than you. That's an issue in storytelling in NXT a lot of times. Yeah, and you know, and part of that is that they can't use the verb wrestle. If they could just say, I, I can out-wrestle you. It, it, it's the fact that it has to always be some other weird verb, like I entertain or something. You can't just say, I, I can I'm out-sports gonna... entertain you Entain- in this ring yeah, right, right now. Right, yeah. I, I'm going to wrestle you into oblivion. Like, yeah, like, yes. you know, like, I, I'm going to wrestle you into the ground. Yeah, easy. Next. Next. Um, Saray defeats Zeta Ramir in, in what continues to just be a perplexing presentation of Saray. Uh, Zeta Ramir just wildly over her head here. This is like if Tony Khan decided to have a match with Kenny Omega and Kenny Omega carried Tony Khan through the match. Uh, it's, yeah, like, you know what it is? It's a little bit like Omega and Allen the Five Angels when he had that uh, when he had that match that everybody kind of trashed. Why is he giving him so much offense? I won't go that far. Uh, I liked Saray as basically female Taz, though. Just oh, suplexing oh, all over the place. Those drop kicks are so legit. God, her drop kicks are the truth, dude. Her like, drop I, kicks are the truth. I just want to watch those. Oh, like they're awesome. She's great. The three belly to backs or two belly to backs in a row where he land. I mean, I I love I love the murder death of it all. But now we're going to make it more complicated because we're getting Zoe Stark involved. Tony Storm is still somewhere in the mix here. It's, it's just... I continue to I like the know. presentation of Zoe Stark. Zoe yes. Stark as, as not... She's a young veteran of sorts, but like a, a, just a respected peer in the locker room among all the baby faces and someone taken formidably by the heels. She, she ha- Yeah, she has a weird veteran gravitas. Yeah, in there, and that's that. And and even though you know they were calling her a rookie, which God, that made its way to NXT UK this week. You're just a rookie, you know, with the uh, not Ben Car- Nathan Frazier. Now Nate, that whole Nathan Frazier interview, which was just here's why I rebranded from a name you saw me before, and then of course, oh, you're just a rookie. It's no, like, the, the, oh, yeah, God, and, the, like, and this is like one of these things. Though this is my true name. Uh, it was that promo. Like you thought that I changed my name to a fake name, but now it's I my thought true that was name. Okay. I, I, you know, I kind of liked the excuse, but you know, it's still kind of contrived in many, many ways. Yeah. But I like go back to this stuff. I like Zoe Stark. Looks like she and Tony storm are going to continue to fight it out again, which is fine. Uh, is it Zeta or Zara? What, what's the, uh, uh Zeta, Zeta, Zeta Ramirez. I, I remember her at ADA or, or AQA on, on the Indies. I forget what it was, but she's a Booker T product. And also uh, she said on uh, that very underrated NXT bit they do for social media with uh, with the ring announcer and with Mackenzie, which is very good. Those two, those two have more personality than any any other person on 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 the main roster doing interviews. But she she wants a match with Ember Moon, who was her mentor in training. And I'm I'm here for that. I'm kind of here for that. I really like that. Um, I'm into she's that. Gonna I'm into to, she's going to continue to develop. Uh, 
fewer shooting star presses, though, unless <laughs> she breaks her neck. But yeah, I like it. Oh my God, that shooting star press. They're like, oh, it was so impressive. I was watching it, and maybe I'm just getting a little too old for this, but I watched that, and it looked unbelievably unsafe. She did not get a strong she, rotation on that. She kind of goes self deprecating on that NXT. Uh, interview for social media she's like yeah <laughs> need to work on that a little bit kind of thing so so she's aware at least yeah but no yeah, no guy- I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to i can't do one i'm not trying to yeah. like, hate too hard but like look i think we all famously have seen what happens when you don't do a shooting Brock. star press well yeah right Brock, right Brock, 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 Brock. no like th- this <laughs> yeah yeah this this can be a killer yeah yeah no absolutely they got a nice little undercard going here, although it, it's going to diminish Tony Storm in some way. But, you know, Zoe Stark and Zeta and uh, and Saray as she continues going. Sarai, however you say Yeah, it. yeah, I, I, yeah. She's going to be... She, when when she gets built up, for, if EO's sticking around on this roster, please don't team these two. Just give me that match and give them 20, 25. I'm here for heel, sir. I'm here for heel Sarai. I think when she goes heel, it's going to be dope. Ooh. That's going to be something, too. Because she is vicious. She has baby face viciousness. And I dig. So does Zoe Zoe Stark in some ways, too. Yeah. Which I dig, too. When she goes heel, that's going to be interesting, too. I I still compare her her demeanor to Ronnie Garvin a bit as a baby face. Yeah. She just kind of has that glue, blue collar solid type thing going. I, I dig her, too. Next up. Next, we have uh, you. You've embraced blue collar solid from Otis here. You're, you're bringing it. You're bringing it into the mix. Um, next, we have LA Knight getting defe- or defeating Jake Atlas. Remember him? What? <laughs> this is oh, so stupid. LA, LA Knight is such. You know what his issue is going to be? Is that he's too perfect for WWE. He really too- is. The, they do not realize how perfect he is for them. Um, he has an EC3 problem right now because he used to be on, I believe he used to be on the roster and they brought him back and he's gotten the, he's gotten the game and they're going to watch him and they're going to go, yeah, I don't see it. <laughs> he doesn't have it anymore. But he is basically doing everything WWE 101, aping somebody's promo style, drops some mic, has a decent two-star match against someone and then leaves and, and poor Jake Atlas should have gone to AEW, but, uh, yeah. Uh, no, I, yep. you know, it, it's, it's hard, it's hard to know, but he's definitely one where I think, I think he could have even known back then that he was kind of, you know, and, and Ethan page, uh, made the right choice and went to AEW. probably a smart move for him. Yeah. Well, also uh, it, it was him and jungle boy. And it was like one of those things where they both had, Oh man. A crossroads because they they had a pretty good match, I believe, at PWG. That's and, right. Uh, yeah, and and yeah, I just uh, God, LA Knight should be a manager who he should be QT Marshall of NXT is what he should be. You know the guy who who get, you know he gets a couple wins I, by cheating and then I he like takes him falls. A little more than you. Um, I don't think he's. I, I don't think he's. I don't mind him. I don't mind him. It's just the character is so. This it's I a, liked Eli it's a, Eli Drake on on yes. NWA was so much better than what LA Knight is. And I think what I'm doing is I'm still thinking that Eli Drake is walking through that curtain and he's not going to. Here here was the problem is Eli Drake eventually got teamed with uh Aaron Stevens slash Damian Sandow, and you knew he was a comedy guy. So all that so that kind of played up promo style worked when he was with guys like him and the question may he rest in peace and those other uh, those, that that kind of that kind of level here he's being treated as serious but he's still doing the turn it up to 12 rock austin hybrid promo like he, he's the honky tonk man in many ways but we're supposed to take him seriously because he's jacked and stuff and i just there's a disconnect for me. I, I, I'd like to see a little bit more of an edge with L.A. Knight, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I There's still not a whole lot of personality, too. Like, I mean, he keeps going. Yeah. I, this whole personality right now is, like, casually going like, oh, you want to sleep with me. Uh, there's nothing better than sleeping than a hot L.A. Knight. Uh, like, that's basically what he's got going. I kind of liked that about that promo, though. That's the thing that gets me is he's doing okay on the picking out targets. 
and getting that kind of heel. But but he's not. But he's never going to fight Johnny Gargano in the way. They're never going to book that. I don't think so. What's the point of cutting a promo? Uh, I mean, and on this Indy? is this has been my issue. This has been my issue with Knight this whole way down. Is I, I almost think, given the current dynamics of NXT, he really should be a babyface, right? Like. It would make more sense if he was coming out there and cutting trash on Johnny Gargano and cutting trash. If on he was Kerry like the Cross. Rock as a baby face, where he just, he gets over by basically being a heel, anti-hero type thing. Yeah, yeah I, I could see that. Yeah, I, I, well, also like LA and I could come out there and actually be cool, unlike Cool Kyle, um, who is not actually cool. But like, yeah, no, I. I if you're gonna do I, the Hollywood gimmick with LA Knight, go big Hollywood. Don't do Bob Holly and Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Hollywood, <laughs> Bob Holly, do do full on, dude. He's he's wearing the Miami Vice suit or whatever the hell he wants to wear. You know, give give it to him, and because he can pull it off. It's not that he can't pull off this Hollywood type of arrogant jerk. He just got to go a little he, bit harder. I mean, it. if he's going to be an arrogant jerk, then he needs to win. He needs to get that title off of Johnny. Yes, and I, and I just and don't see that. And he needs to stop doing feuds with Thick Boy and guys on that level. And having basically 80, 20 matches where he pulls thick, it out. Thick boy is uh, poor guy. He, he is Bronson Reed is just stuck in the middle of nowhere. Cause he ain't beating Karrion Cross and he's never going to no. beat Johnny Gargano. Nope. Next. Next. Um, Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell. Okay. Uh, and before we go into the, before we go into this, we need to, we need to, to wrap up the promos things. Cause there's two okay. on my list here that I remember. Okay. Uh, Raquel Gonzalez and, Mer- and Mercedes Martinez. Yes. I thought that was very good. I thought this was very good. Raquel, back to being a heel, <laughs> I guess, after yes. the, kind of the faux baby face thing. Mercedes a little bit more intense, but uh, I, I thought this. I thought both did well by themselves in this, in this tete-a-tete. Yes. Okay. I thought you might have more. No, I, uh, I don't. And then, um, and then Legado and, and del then, Fantasma was good. That was good too, and then also uh, uh, Cameron Grimes goes to the club, and the club gets bought out. This million dollar man thing is going to be a running joke now, isn't it? Yes. Every week, yeah. I, I'm. Uh, I, I I'm already done with it. Uh, like like once it's, was oh, fine. It once was, was good. Don't. It was fine it at the jewelry now. store, but like him buying the club. I mean, like it also. If you actually been following DBS, like I don't know if you actually are still into DBS and you know anything about like what he does now with his life, like you know that he doesn't do this sorts of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. and the million dollar man character's been like I, I, I it's it, it was nobody like, ever evolves, Chris. They're always the same guy they were in the WWE universe when they left and when they come back. Well, uh, like. Yes. I mean, then it's like, who am I rooting for between DiBiase and Grimes? I guess DiBiase, yeah. right? DiBiase, like, because he's outsmarting the 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 flaky, rich, dumb heel. But yeah, we like Cameron Grimes. Uh, Grimes, I, I I know it's 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 weird. Um, and Grimes right, now, actually now that, is less uh, uh, offensive in some ways than Ted DiBiase. Now the tag match. Now the tag match. Ember Moon. And Shotzi Blackheart lose the titles to Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell, which I'm not going to lie, it was a bit of a surprise for me given the way that we built into this match. Um, you know, such a, such a weird little match. Although I guess it actually kind of gets into Frankie Monet as this power broker pulling all the strings <laughs> back. No, I, no, you laugh. You laugh. But, like, let's break this down. Monet spoofs the Dexter Loomis flowers to piss off um, Indy Hartwell, getting Indy Hartwell all psyched up to get into this match. Monet puts her dog into the tank so they can't even ride the tank out to the ring. Monet's in all of these different little backstage segments, and, and I think what this is ultimately building to is that, like, yeah, she always seems like she's this, like, aloof fashionista, and it all seems sort of innocent, and, like... Oh, okay, Frankie's maybe a little bit obnoxious, but she's not really mean. But what it really is is that Frankie is calculating, and she is manipulative, and that she's been doing all... And, and the cute little dog is a weapon, and, and all the nicey-nice stuff is a form of a weapon, and that she's actually sabotaged Indian Shotzi Blackheart. And at the end of this match, I was like, huh, 
did they just take me for a ride in this Frankie Monet character? And I didn't realize that there's actually been a lot more narrative that's been laid out here in the last few weeks and that I was maybe giving credit to. Chris, there's a Frankie Manet in the back too. And I'm just getting, we're going to get all our French expressionists paintings mixed up. There's a Frankie Monet and a Frankie Manet. And we're going to always get that And, and, and there's talking. Frankie Manet's, but he's largely a preliminary guy. Yeah. He loses most of his matches. Yeah. Old Frankie, Frankie Manet's. Re- Frankie Renoir somewhere in the back too. Yeah. Um, I liked this match. I didn't love it, but it definitely over delivered on the violence scale, especially Indy Hartwell, who is they, sneaky and they tall. Made sense. They made sense as to why she was extra aggressive in this match. Yes. She was trying. Yeah. Um, Shotzi didn't kill herself. It looked like they were setting her up for that chair spot. She did in the evolve match. They got her signed. I'm kind of glad they didn't do that, but it must be said now again, they did not give these NXT women's tag division, the big belts from the main roster because we had to do the Reggie Bechdel story. And we have now given these titles to the only three teams really worth a damn in this division already. And it's not even a couple months old yet. We have two other teams who aren't very good, but have potential in, in, uh, <laughs> in, yeah, no, in, I mean, Kate, Casey and Caden apparently Casey, are going to be, Casey they're going to be the merch. ones who beat, they're going to be the ones who beat the way here at some point, but they're just going to be transitional champions. Their, too. their promo, their promos are bad. I, no offense to Kay, and she needs to cut out the colored contact thing. I, I just, I'm done it's not that. working for her. It's not like, or if you're going to do the colored contact thing, it needs to make sense with the outfits. Like, but, Here's but my, well, no, yeah. they did to match her hair, the bright green eyes. It's just, and then you have Kamea and Aaliyah who are just clowns. They might get better. I don't have my, you have this, but you have a well, and then you have this, what I like to call a potential pool a pretty good tag teams if you want them between Tony Storm, Mercedes Martinez, uh, Zoe Stark, Saray, Z- Saray, Zeta, Io, if, Io, if you want to throw her in the mix with Saray for some reason, which I don't want to do because of the entire Kabuki Warriors type thing is just too much of a stereotype. You know, you have some, and you anybody in NXT UK you wanted to bring over and turn into a team. You have that pool of potential here. Give them the belts to play around with, but you've already gone through. Uh, you've already gone through Raquel and Dakota, and now Shotzi and Ember, and now Candice and Indy. Very very quickly, and these belts, which were supposed to mean so much for somebody who fought their way through a tournament which involved these teams is now just, it's a hot potato and it, it's, it's, it's just a trinket again, like other titles of less prestige. When the women's tag titles were always introduced. I mean, look, they were originally introduced to be placated for Sasha and Bailey. We get it, but it always had potential to be more. And it's, they just, it's, it's frustrating. Sorry, I had to go on that little, but uh, the no, match itself. It, it, the match itself Candace is fine. Is tough. Candice yeah. is tough as nails. I mean, I've I've watched Candice in other hardcore matches before, and her being pretty and blonde belies how tough she is at times. And I don't mean that in a sexist way. It's it's just one of those things where no, you look at her. I mean, her nickname's the Pine Size Pixie. You see this like yes. small little girl and, and small little woman, and you, and you just don't anticipate her to yes. be able to take the amount of damage, the amount of punishment, and just have like a real zest for it. Um, she will that Candace blade. does. She will blame. No, and yeah, I know, dude. She, like... She's dope. Yeah, no, Candace rocks, man. Yeah, Candace is awesome. And Indy, Indy overperformed here, and I, you know, I'm not as high as others on Indy necessarily, but she's so young that you can't be down on her either. She still has time to grow here. And and her doing that uh, springboard elbow. And it landed flush, and it was great looking. And, you know, it 
the, her high spots were on point. Now she needs to learn how to put together a bit of a story a bit. It, she, she's no got worker. a lot of personality, too. Here's the thing. If she can do high spots and she's got personality, I kind of think we can. Way. Yeah, I, yeah, I think I think we can bring it together in the middle here. And, I feel good about and that. That's, and that's not to shade Shotzi and Ember in this match either, because oh, those no, two, yeah. Shotzi was on point with a lot of her yes. stuff. She can sometimes be out of control, and she was this was, great. This was very much good Shotzi. This is very much good Shotzi. Yes, this is very good Shotzi, and this was good Ember as well. I think Ember. I liked kind of the story of them kind of directing each other in there and then it ended up failing them a bit. I know you've been kind of thinking that Ember's going heel. If that's the story they're going to tell, that's a pretty good setup for it. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, I, I, I still think that's where we're going. Um, and yeah, no, I, I think they did. They did a nice job here. Um, and, and like, if she does go heel, the honest mistake component of this, like there was a miscommunication, yes, but it was like largely an honest mistake. I think actually works yes. really well. Yeah, yeah, I do too. Yeah. Uh, anything else on any show that we forgot that you would like to bring? I I don't think so. I think we I think we got I think we got all of it. I think we got all of it. I think we had a pretty good show. But uh, hey, we're gonna do our plugs, and you all should listen to us right now. Uh, you can follow me at Crap Game Thirteen. You can follow Chris at DWATG. That is short for Don't Worry About the Government. If you need a mnemonic device to think of such things, uh, it's just, it's an acronym. So just say Dwatka. Say yeah. Say Dwatka. like a mantra. <laughs> Dwatka. You can, follow, you can follow the show at Shake Them Ropes, all one word. We are part of the Voices of Wrestling Network, where Chris is an underappreciated asset. Oh, I forgot to say. The best used, kept used, secret of the Voices of Wrestling Network. He used to do Lucha Underground and Dario Cueto's back in MLW. How cool is that, Chris? I am, I am excited. Prod. I'm excited about that. Uh, as Tekka Underground or whatever, I, I guess I'll check out whatever they end up doing with the... Uh, they're running a show here in September uh, in Dallas, I believe. Uh, MLW. So the odds of me being at that show are very high. And if MLW wants to get the former host of Lucha Underground tickets to the Dallas show, I'm just saying, put hit it up, out hit up there. Rich, hit, up, hit up Rich and Joe. I think they'd be, a, or I can I can actually hit up Court because I kind of have a rapport with them. I'll try. I'll try. Yeah, for no, that. I, I, yeah, you can yeah. Give me a report. Yeah, um, I would love to. Yeah, and you know the people want you to be overexposed, so maybe you'd start doing your NWA MLW podcast for the Voices of Wrestling Network. Which do, do, is, by do, the way, is there, on, is there on any YouTube. interest? Is there any interest whatsoever in an NWA show? Because I will, well, if people if people really care about that, I can watch it. I'll do ten minutes on it every week. I'm not going to go Chris, like an extent. Chris, we can fold it into this if we need to. Okay. If you really, okay, want, if yeah, you're passionate yeah, yeah. about a point. Yeah, I, I I can I can give you ten minutes on NWA, but that's probably about the ceiling. Um, give the people right. what they want. Plug DWATG. First, I'm giving the people what they want. I, Hawkins, today I am rocking my Dwight Howard loyalty <laughs> T-shirt. I want <sighs> you to know this <sighs> is from this is the season where Dwight Howard spent the entire season complaining that he wanted to get traded. Uh, but oh. Not no, he didn't have a rose in his butt. That that was on wrestling this week. Um, he he was complaining that he wanted to get traded from Orlando, and then they signed him to a one-year extension, and he left the team. But the second they signed him to a one-year extension, then and only then did Orlando put out these loyalty T-shirts. And that, I've always felt like nothing it better epitomizes loyalty. I feel very loyal when I wear this shirt. Um, don't worry about the government can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify, also on Patreon. This week... Is very special, Hawkins. Maybe Hawkins will be calling in because this week on Sunday night around 7 p.m. Central Time ish, check the Twitter at DWATG for a hard start time. It is open DWATG this week. If you've ever wanted to call in to don't worry about the government, ruin it, immiserate it, yell at me about a topic, listen in as we're doing topics, you can do it once every 20 episodes it is possible. This week is episode 520, so go and follow me at DWATG, listen to the show, don't worry about the government on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify, and I'll see you Sunday night, people. I will never talk politics in public again, but I might call in and do 10 minutes on why Dwight Howard is a soft quitter. Loyalty.